is going to be used to make an embryonic stem cell. So the egg cell has the nucleus removed. The nucleus from a skin cell is then injected into that egg. That egg, you'll remember, can then initiate development by dividing, making a blastocyst. Here's this important reprogramming phenomena going on, the details of which are still unknown. The cells now begin to divide, continue to divide to make a blastocyst with an inner cell mass. And then it's from the inner cell mass in that blastocyst that an embryonic stem cell can be derived. There's our inner cell mass, the source of new cells. So how might we do that with one of these diseases? I'm going to only give one example, the example of ALS, but I'd like you to keep in mind that this could, be, this could pertain to any of the degenerative diseases that I've described this morning. Let's look at what would be involved. Well, the first step, an important one, is to get the host cytoplasm. In this case, it's from a human female. It's an unfertilized egg that would be taken in the same methods used to do in vitro fertilization procedures. In fact, one could note that our society encourages people um, and allows people to donate this tissue for the treatment of infertility. And what I'm proposing here is the similar donation for the treatment of other diseases. In this case, the patient, the ALS patient, which we then know has the genes that give rise to the disease, donates a skin cell, the skin cell fibroblast shown there. The nucleus from the fibroblast is removed and injected into the unfertilized and enucleated oocyte. That can be used then to give rise to these embryonic stem cells, all in a dish. Now, what would we do with these cells? An important point that I think has been missed in the popular press is that these cells are not useful in terms of transplanting them back into patients. If a person has a disease where they're missing a particular kind of neuron, it doesn't do us any good to make more of those neurons. What we want to do is to use the genetic makeup of these ES cells to understand why a person gets that disease in the first place, to get at the mechanism or the root cause. And I'm sure you'll agree that if you understand the mechanism, you're in a much better place to try to figure out how to do something about it. So let's have a look at what that would involve. In this case, then, we have two kinds of embryonic stem cells. On the left, the disease-specific cells, here ALS. And the HES stands for human embryonic stem cell. On the right, control human embryonic stem cells. In both cases, scientists will cause them to become different, that is, to differentiate in a Petri dish by the kinds of methods I've described already. So this is directed differentiation protocols telling the cells what to do, telling them to become motor neurons. And I think it's obvious to you now that what you want to know is what happens to the cells on the left? Where do they screw up? At what stage do things go wrong? Did some gene come on which shouldn't? Did some gene stay on too long? Did some gene go off which was important? At the moment, we don't know any of those facts about these diseases. And we can test these cells because they're in a dish, not in a person's body or in a person's brain. And we can test them with a number of assays. Here's the assay beginning on the right that we've already covered. We can look at their gene expression. In theory, one could look at their gene expression every few minutes and say which genes came on and off at any time. We can also do electrophysiology to test for the function of these neurons at any point. And one very useful assay is to look at precipitates which form in these cells, particularly in this disease. They're so-called amyloid inclusion bodies. And these are precipitates of cellular proteins which are closely correlated with the dysfunction or the failure of these cells both to survive and to function. This then tells us about what the causes of the disease might be. But I think even more exciting is to try to combine this with looking for drugs that would prevent the disease progression. Again, this is something one can't really do in patients. One doesn't take 100 people that you imagine are going to get ALS and then start randomly treating them with drugs to see what effect they might have. Here, however, we can do the following experiment. We can take the embryonic stem cells, have them go through the differentiation protocol in a Petri dish, and then do chemical screening. I think this holds enormous process for the next few years to try to find drugs that slow or prevent this neural degeneration. 
Now, I should emphasize this does not cure the disease. It doesn't reverse the process, but it does slow it down. So if a patient is suffering from such a disease, it would be an enormous benefit to slow the process, say, just by a factor of two. If it took twice as long to lose your memory or to lose motor function, that would be a major advance. Now, before I end, I want to point out something else with this slide. To achieve this kind of goal requires the interaction between scientists with lots of different talents or expertise. We need developmental biologists to make the stem cells, cell biologists to cause them to differentiate, and chemical biologists to help with this chemical screening. So I'd like you to think about, as your career goes forward, about working with teams of people that can bring different talents to bear on complicated problems like this. In my own case, I benefit enormously from my colleagues Lee Rubin and Stu Schreiber in thinking about the chemical screening. And so I just point out that that can be very important and helpful in trying to take on complex problems. Let me finish before questions with this last slide, the one I'd like you to sort of dream about, which is how does one combine stem cell biology with treatments of new diseases? I propose two ways today. One is to take human embryonic stem cells and to understand how we can tell them what to do, how we can determine their fates turn them into a pancreatic beta cell or some other cell type. The other is to derive specific kinds of stem cells, what we would call disease-specific stem cells, and figure out why these cells screw up in human development, study them in a dish, and try to find ways to prevent them from causing so much trouble. So before I take questions, I just wanted to say that, of course, the work I described today isn't all my own. It's from many colleagues, not all of whom I've been able to note, and I'll be happy to show on the DVD all of the people who've been involved in this research. And I thank you for your attention, and let's take some questions now. Yes, let's go here. I had a question about, um, actually from the, from the first one, the first part that you were talking about. I was interested really, I was really interested in the cows. You said that the, the farmers or the people, the scientists who clone them, they use them for economic purposes. Like the, the, the certain traits that they have are really, you know, profitable. But wouldn't that have also a very negative effect? Because since you're cloning all of them, the same genetic, like this almost similar, wouldn't that have a real effect later on? Like a real, since they're not, they're not like, a, how can I explain, like, um, let's say a disease comes, I'm like, they have I see no what you mean. Yes, I, I think you have a very good intuition there. I think I understand what you mean. Is Wouldn't it be a bad idea if every cow was genetically yeah, exactly the, same? the same? That's right. And this problem is true for all of agriculture, both plants and animals. Um, I doubt that any farmer, let alone whole states or the whole nation, is thinking about having all genetically identical cows. But you raise a very good point. Um, another use of animals like that has been to produce human proteins in milk. So the way human proteins are now made is expensive and complicated in large incubators. But it turns out one can very efficiently produce human proteins in sh sheep or goat or cow milk. And so that's another use of that kind of technology. But I'm glad you brought up that point because it's true for not just farm animals, but also for plants. One doesn't want to have to lose our important variation in nature. There you go. Up here in the hat. I was wondering, you said that, um, that uh, s some cells can, some uh, differentiated cells can be used to make clones. Does that imply that some can't? Yes. Um, I, I was careful in my saying some, and I'm glad you caught that, because it would be wrong to conclude that all cells contain all of the information. We know from years of study in immunology, for example, that cells of your immune system have had genetic rearrangements, and they, they would be unlikely to be capable of giving rise to a full animal. Uh, there could also be other mutations that have arisen during the course of the animal's development, which would make it incapable, that is, make the nucleus incapable of giving rise to a full animal. I would be careful, though, to focus on the issue of trying to make adult animals, because as you'll remember from the second part of my talk, it's not making cloned adult animals that one's so concerned with. It's making genetic copies of cells, and the cells don't require the, the full ray of all reprogramming, probably, in order to enable us to, say, direct the synthesis of a 